Thank you. Yeah, you just missed the Oro Pendulos were singing just a minute ago, but I don't hear them anymore. Dr. Questioner, I have five after. Do you, I'm sure we'll have more dialing in um, soon. Would you like to get started just for the sake of time? I agree. Let's do it. Okay, great. And it's being recorded, right? For anybody who wants it to. It is. Okay. Yeah. Yes. That's Our fine. session is being recorded this evening uh, and will be available uh, tomorrow uh, and also will be posted on the MSD website um, for anyone who is interested in the recording. Good evening, my name is Lynn Robinson. I'm the Director of Physician Relations and Professional Education at the Medical Society of Delaware. Thank you for attending this Hot Topic Education session. Hot Topic presentations under the direction of MSD past president, Dr. Stephen Kushner, address urgent issues and bring important education to our members and the medical community. This session is approved for AMA PRA Category 1 credit. Following tonight's session, an email will be sent to all attendees with instructions on how to claim your credit. So please make sure that your name is displayed correctly um, on your Zoom. Today's speaker has no financial relationships with ineligible companies to disclose. Please, uh, we ask that you mute your computers and your phones this evening. We'll be using the chat box and we ask that you type any questions for Dr. Epps into the chat box to be addressed following the presentation. Dr. Stephen Kushner will now introduce our speaker. Good evening, Dr. Kushner. Good evening. Our guest speaker this evening is Dr. Stephen Epps who will provide an update on measles. The CDC has recently issued alerts on the rise as cases in the US and Delaware um, of measles and Delaware reported a case at Nemours Children's Hospital in January. Stephen Epps, MD, specializes in pediatric infectious diseases at Christiana Care Health System. He is an active on many Christiana Care committees and serves not only as director of pediatric infectious diseases, but also as an associate infection prevention officer for Christiana Care. Throughout his career, Dr. Epps has been recognized for his clinical and teaching skills among his many repeat honors, he has received numerous teaching awards from the pediatric residents. Dr. Epps earned his medical degree from the University of South Florida in Tampa and completed his internship and residency in pediatrics at Bowman Gray Wake Forest School of Medicine in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. He then completed a fellowship in pediatric infectious disease at Duke University in Durham, North Carolina. We are delighted that Dr. Epps is joining us tonight to talk about measles. 
Dr. Epps. All right. Well, thank you, Lynn, and thank you, Steve, uh, for that kind introduction. So this first slide uh, kind of speaks for itself, but uh, go to the next slide, please, Lynn. All right. Well, it is a, a pleasure to be here. Um, I I'm pretty sure we did something like this in person back in 2019 when we were having the measles outbreak um, at that time. Uh, so I just had to spiff this up and add some new material. Hopefully this will be the um, the, the kind of guidance that you'll need uh, because I think even though the present outbreak is uh, under control, we're going to have future outbreaks. I can just about guarantee it. Next slide. Uh, when I lecture on this topic, I always want to acknowledge my former mentor, um, who you see pictured there, that's Dr. Sam Katz. He was actually chairman of Department of Pediatrics at Duke when I was there completing my Infectious Diseases Fellowship. Um, and Sam was an integral member of the team that developed the measles vaccine, which rolled out 60 years ago, um, and arguably one of the most important vaccines ever on the face of the earth. Next slide. Um, I have no disclosures. These are the objectives. We'll talk a lot about epidemiology of measles, um, past, present, um, in both the United States and globally. Um, one of the most important things I wanna emphasize are the clinical manifestations. So those clinicians out there can recognize it if you have a, a case or a suspected case. Um, and then we'll talk about the initial management of a suspected case and how to report it. Next slide. So we'll start with a case. This was uh, uh, the last case uh, of measles that was seen at Christiana Care. It was an adult. Um, just, you can just keep going through the bullets. She was 29 years of age. Uh, she presented to the emergency department here at the Newark campus. Um, chief complaints were fever, rash, and cough. She'd previously been seen in, the, in a medical aid unit where she had not yet developed a rash and she was thought to perhaps have influenza and was treated with oseltamivir. Next. Um, the fever had started five days prior to her arrival in the emergency department and it was very high. Then she developed a rash on her face and neck and it spread downward also with some GI symptoms. Uh, she did have a travel history and that was important. Uh, she had returned to the United States just 12 days prior to this ED visit. And I'll tell you one more thing about her is she had had one MMR shot when she was little. Next slide. Her physical exam showed those vital signs, uh, febrile tachycardic. Um, on her HENT exam, she had small white spots on her buccal mucosa uh, and then later on developed conjunctival injection. Uh, uh, she had a maculopapular rash on her uh, neck, chest, abdomen, back, buttocks, and upper extremities. She had some laboratory studies done, uh, maybe more than she needed, but she had a CMP that showed mildly elevated transaminases, a chest x-ray, which was normal, and um, measles IgM, which was positive. She was admitted to the observation unit and recovered uneventfully. Thankfully, she had been masked when she was in the triage area. Uh, all of the employees that saw her were immune and we experienced no secondary cases. But this is the exact kind of thing that everybody needs to be aware of uh, and do what we did, which is mask the patient, get them immediately into a room, do a, a, a good history and physical examination and some um, studies to get you the correct diagnosis. Next slide. So this global map is very recent. Uh, it was just developed by the World Health Organization within the last month or two, and it shows the hotspots for measles. And, and the top 10 are down on the bottom right of your screen uh, with Yemen way out in front, uh, like Yemen needed any other problems, right? Um, but in the pre-vaccination era, everybody got measles. It was universal. It was a rite of passage. It usually occurred in childhood. Uh, and there were anywhere from two to three million fatalities a year. Currently, um, the WHO estimates that only about one in 10 cases are reported. And while I think that the chart on the right, uh, you know, highlights where the hotspots are, uh, I think we do a much better job globally of reporting measles deaths than actual cases. And in 2022, the last year for which there are complete data, there were 136,000 measles deaths. Next slide. Now, 
Europe didn't make it to the top 10, but I want to tell you there's a lot of measles in Europe and practically no European country has been spared. So there you see it. Um, the hotspots are Romania and oddly enough, Austria, but um, the UK is experiencing more than their share of measles as, as well. Next slide. And this is big news. And this is going to be where our next measles cases come from, I do believe. Uh, in 2022, there are a total of less than a thousand reported cases in Europe. By the end of December of 2023, there were 42,000 from across Europe. Uh, and this led to the publication of the uh, New York Times article that you see on the right. Uh, so this is a warning. Uh, so it is here, it is across the pond, but next slide. We have plenty of people who visit Europe as a vacation or business destination spot. Uh, the CDC has developed this uh, nice uh, planning a trip um, uh, screen where you can actually click on the, the link that you see there and answer a few questions and find out if you need a measles vaccine before traveling to Europe or anywhere else, actually. But it's been bad in Europe. It's affected all ages. 40% uh, of cases are young children. There have been 21,000 hospitalizations and five deaths. Um, and the reason for this is kind of the same as what we're experiencing here in the United States, which I'll show you, uh, which is a reduction in measles vaccination as a direct consequence of the pandemic. It dropped across Europe from 96% to 93%, and that's all it takes, because we know that you have to have about 95% of the population immune to avoid ongoing measles transmission. So they slipped just a little bit, and now they have a big problem. There are a total of 1.8 million young children in Europe who have been unimmunized, and if you just look at the UK, only 85% of children starting school there have had both jabs. That's, that's what the Brits call shots. Next slide. So here in the United States, um, these are data uh, from early in the pandemic. So we're going back to March of 2020 here. And what you can see is a marked drop in immunization rates for both young children uh, under two, which is in the dark blue, and then older kids, which is in the gray. Um, and that was, of course, a direct result of um, clinics and offices limiting the uh, patient care that they were providing. And so immunization rates dropped way down. Uh, next slide. This led the CDC to come out with this guidance. Now, you may remember, and I'm going to show you in a little while, that we had just come off a really bad measles year in 2019. So CDC and other public health authorities were afraid that, you know, with immunization rates dropping, we were going to see not only COVID, but a, a surge in measles cases as well. So the guidance came out uh, to, to physicians and, and other um yeah, you know, people who gave vaccines to children to please try to get kids caught up. And the next slide shows New York City on the next slide, right there. Um, and top it, top segment is kids less than 24 months. Uh, the bottom is uh, kids two to 18 years. So we did start to catch up and that's good, uh, but we have still not gotten back to pre pandemic immunization rates. In the United States, in the, the period of 2020 to 2022, it was estimated that 61 million doses of MMR vaccine either were delayed or missed completely. And, and for the 2022-2023 school year, only 93.1% of children in kindergarten had received two doses of MMR. Well, that looks almost like what was seen in Europe. Um, which is giving me great concern that we are going to have more measles um, as a result of returning travelers and then being spread in this country. Next slide. <laughs> so um, before um, Dr. Katz and his team rolled the, the measles vaccine out in the um, early to mid-1960s, there were over half a million cases of measles in the United States every year. Um, uh, excuse me, those are reported cases, uh, but many aren't reported, so the, the true number was estimated to be up to 4 million cases with about 500 deaths. Uh, and then you see when the measles vaccine was introduced back in 1963 and 1964, there was a marked reduction in uh, the cases of measles uh, until we got to 1989, 1991, when there was a marked resurgence with over 55,000 cases and a lot of deaths. Um, and that led 
Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, that peak right there led to the recommendation for a second dose. So what happens with measles vaccine is not um, waning immunity like we see with pertussis, for example, but primary vaccine failure. Uh, so giving a second dose got a lot of those people who had not developed an immune response uh, to where they were immune. So that uh, has done a great job um, almost through the present time. Next slide. In, in, in the year 2000, measles was declared eliminated in the United States. That's not the same as eradication. Eradication is what's happened to smallpox and rinderpest, but elimination means you've had no endemic measles transmission for a period of 12 months. So that was a major milestone. Next slide. So you know, we're gonna talk about the Philadelphia-based outbreak that's just happened in the last couple of months. But first I wanna just remind you of what happened to uh, Philadelphia in 1990 and 1991. Where there are, where there were 1,400 cases of measles and six deaths, um, mostly in children, and uh, right in the middle of your screen should be the Faith Tabernacle Church. There were a couple of uh, fundamentalist churches uh, uh, in Philadelphia whose communities did not vaccinate, and that led to the horrible problem that we saw in this area back in 1990, 1991. And I've seen my share of measles, but most of them were back in that time frame. Next slide. So this this slide builds, Lynn, so just keep advancing. So this shows that since we were declared eliminated, uh, we've had multiple, multiple measles outbreaks. And I just wanna take you through some of them because I think they're illustrative. So if you could just forward. So in Ohio in 2014, there were a number of outbreaks, um, mostly in the Amish community who um, to, usually does not vaccinate their children. Next. Uh, I think most people are probably aware of the Disneyland outbreak, which occurred in uh, 2015. Um, and this was a result of a person from the Philippines visiting Disneyland. We don't know who it was, but we know that it was a Filipino measles strain that was introduced at the theme park and that a lot of people, almost all of them unimmunized, uh, got exposed. They then turned around and took measles back into their own communities and non-immune people in those communities got measles. So you may not know about what happened in Minnesota back in uh, 2017. This happened to the Somali population. There's a large Somali population there. Um, and they were experiencing a lot of autism, unfortunately, in their kids. And um, they reported it to the public health authorities uh, who didn't really help at that time. But it was also learned by the anti-vaxxing community that they were having a lot of autism diagnosed in their children. The anti-vaxxers, went to the Somalis and they said, you know why you're having this, right? Because you're giving your children MMR vaccine. So they stopped or uh, the rates of MMR vaccination dropped significantly and they had a major outbreak uh, in Minnesota and it spread beyond the Somali population as well. And then more recently in 2018 and 2019, there was a, a, a huge problem with measles that was largely in the um, New Jersey and New York uh, Orthodox Jewish communities, but it spread beyond there. So it went, if you'll advance it, to a total of 28 states in the United States. Now, Delaware is not on that list, but all of our uh, adjacent states are, which included New Jersey, Maryland, and Pennsylvania. So big outbreak there. Next slide. So this um, uh, New Jersey, New York outbreak uh, occurred as a result of an unimmunized um, person in that uh, Orthodox Jewish population who went to Israel, brought it back from Israel, where they have um, unfortunately still got some measles, uh, and then it spread to all those other uh, areas that I showed you. Next slide. So let's uh, fast forward to the present. As Dr. Kushner mentioned, this national alert went out uh, at the end of January. I'm sure most of you got it. Um, and what it describes here is, at this point, 23 confirmed cases of measles uh, involving all of those jurisdictions that you see there. Uh, most of these 
had, or among children and adolescents who had not been vaccinated. Um, so, uh, you know, already there's a lesson learned. Next slide. So in the Philadelphia area outbreak, which was the largest outbreak in the December, uh, January timeframe, the first case was imported as a result of foreign travel. And that child wound up being hospitalized at CHOP in late December. Um, all of the patients in this outbreak were non-immune. Uh, there turned out to be nine confirmed cases, four of whom were hospitalized. One actually resided in Camden. And then there was this case at uh, Nemours Children's Hospital here in Delaware that was an eight month old who actually was from Southeastern Pennsylvania, came for a minor surgical procedure uh, while he was um, actually uh, infectious, but not yet symptomatic. Um, and then he, he, after he recovered, he uh, went back to Southeastern Pennsylvania to a hospital where he was diagnosed with measles. And they, of course, notified infection prevention at Nemours Children's Hospital, as well as DPH, who performed extensive contact tracing. Um, and there were up to 30 people who were possibly exposed. All, all, most all of them were in the PACU at Nemours. So um, fortunately, there were no other cases. Uh, and now we're 14 at more than 14 days since the last case. So this outbreak should be over. But what I'm here to tell you is that we will experience more outbreaks because we have so many non-immune people in the United States and because there's so much measles around the world. Next slide. So you may not know it, but the Philadelphia Department of Health is an excellent health department. And they uh, did a, a bang up job of doing the contact tracing and advising people um, you know, what they needed to do. And I just show you something from their website. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the people, some of the people who were told to quarantine their kids who'd been exposed failed to do so. So they took their, uh, they let their children attend daycare. It's just amazing to me that we didn't have a much worse outbreak as a result of people not obeying the quarantine and just because of so many people being non-immune. Next slide. And then this came out from DPH um, earlier in January just to warn uh, families basically that measles is serious business. It's not just a rash. Uh, so getting the word out as we are here this evening uh, through the Medical Society of Delaware. Next slide. So some very important basic facts about measles. It's highly infectious. It's probably the most infectious disease known to man. Um, if you are not immune and you're exposed, there's a 90% chance that you will get measles. Uh, and then remember that 95% figure, uh, that's the number in a population that's required to stop ongoing transmission. And I showed you the rates of um, vaccination in children in Europe and children in the United States, and that's below 95%, which is why I think we might be headed for trouble. This was nearly universal um, in the pre-vaccine era. Almost all kids got it, 99 point something percent. Uh, usually in the preschool age or school age children. It, since vaccine rolled out 60 years ago, most infections in children have occurred in infants six to 12 months of age. And there's a very good reason for that. One is that we don't immunize until age 12 months. And the other is that, um, that maternal immunity in terms of IgG that crosses the placenta is largely gone by six months of age. So for those reasons, that population is um, badly affected, which is also um, a bad thing because they can get pretty severe disease. Next slide. The incubation period uh, it averages 10 to 12 days from the exposure to the prodrome. The prodrome is, are the nonspecific symptoms that occur prior to the rash. Um, infected patients are contagious four days prior to the rash, which is exactly what happened at Nemours Children's Hospital. So that person uh, was in that period of time when he could have exposed a number of people. This is mostly an airborne disease. Um, a virus remains viable in air samples for up to two hours after the person, the infected person leaves the room. Uh, it can also be infectious through direct contact. Uh, with uh, infectious droplets or contaminated surfaces, but mostly it's an airborne disease. Next slide. Um, and it's an acute febrile viral respiratory illness like we have so much of going on right now, right? We've had RSV, influenza, COVID, um, and the prodrome here would be maybe a little bit difficult to distinguish from some of those other viruses. So it's the three Cs, cough, coryza, and conjunctivitis. 
Um, but then you develop the pathognomonic in anthem, which is called coplic spots. Um, these are, um, which you can, you can just advance. These are the white to gray little um, dots that you see that are likened to grains of salt or grains of sand on a red background. And this occurs for a very transient period of time, just before and just after the measles rash develops. Now I mentioned I've seen my share of measles. Um, I've never seen coplic spots because I usually get called once the measles rash is well established and these things occur right at the beginning of the rash and are very transient. Next slide. The rash begins on day two through four of illness. Uh, it is erythematous and maculopapular. If you've ever heard the expression morbilliform, that means measles-like. It usually begins on the face near the hairline and then it spreads downward. And as it spreads, the previously affected areas of skin may develop confluent erythema. And I'll show you some examples. Next slide. So here's a girl who uh, is probably day five or so into her illness. Uh, she's still got her weepy eyes and nose that you can see. She's miserable looking, but uh, the rash has become largely confluent on her head, neck, um, face, and upper chest. Next slide. So just keep in mind that on the first day of illness, that's when you may see, uh, first day of rash, that's when you may see coplic spots and you'll see just a few bumps. Um, and then uh, as time goes on, uh, as that cartoon shows that by the third day of rash, you're seeing a lot more skin lesions and it's becoming confluent on the face and neck and upper chest. Next slide. That little boy is on day four of his measles. And the next slide is about the same. So let this is an extreme close-up of the measles. So let that um, burn a copy into your retinas because that's what we want you to look out for and not miss. Next slide. Well, the reason we worry about measles is because it can cause a number of complications and can cause a fatal outcome. So these are common and usually not severe um, complications. They include acute otitis media, uh, bronchopneumonia, croup, and diarrhea. But the next series of complications are severe, and they include encephalitis, one in a thousand, that can cause permanent brain damage. Death, which is usually due to either respiratory or neurologic complications. And SSPE, which you don't see at the time they've got the measles. This is a late occurring degenerative central nervous, nervous system disease, usually happening seven to 10 days after measles, and it's 100% fatal. Next slide. Uh, sorry. Uh, people who are at highest risk for complications include infants and children under five, adults greater than 20 years, pregnant women, people who are immunocompromised, and vitamin A deficiency, which we don't see too much in the United States, but in places like Sub-Saharan Africa, which has a large burden of measles, that is a, a very significant risk factor for severe disease. Next slide. People who are immunocompromised uh, have a, an altered presentation. They may have a different appearance of the rash, or the rash may be absent altogether. They are at higher risk for complications and higher risk for a fatal outcome. They can excrete the virus for a longer period of time, and unfortunately, they may not respond well to vaccination. Next slide. So back to this um, alert that came out on January 25th, and I'm not gonna read it all to you. You probably have it in your inbox, or you can go to the CDC and find it. Uh, but the, the main points are, number one, that your most important diagnostic tool is a good history and physical exam which is why I wanted to describe all the clinical characteristics and show you those pictures of rashes. Uh, and then the, uh, the five bullet points on the right are th what the CDC and other public health authorities want us all to do, which is if you suspect a case, to put them in isolation, to notify the proper public health authorities, test the patient, uh, provide initial management, and last but not least, of course, is to vaccinate the population as much as possible. Next slide. So I'm putting on my infection prevention 
hat here and just saying what CDC provides as far as guidance for healthcare facilities. So if you were to get a call or you're in the emergency department and it sounds like it might be a case of measles coming in, you want to tell uh, whoever it is um, where to go, how to enter the facility um, uh, and immediately uh, try to put a face mask on the person and get them back into an exam room as quickly as possible. Next slide. If you're suspecting measles in a healthcare facility, we certainly don't want it to spread. Um, and and that, that did happen in this outbreak that we've just had uh, at, um, at St. Christopher's and at um, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. So um, limit the tra transport of patients uh, with known or suspected measles such that you're only moving them through the facility as absolutely essential uh, and have them wear a face mask during transport. And there's more information at that website. You want to put them on proper precautions, uh, and that means airborne precautions. Uh, it can the measles um, virus can remain in particles that are suspended in the air for two hours after the person leaves the room. So you have to maintain airborne transmission precautions, uh, and you as a healthcare provider should don appropriate PPE, and that would include an N95 mask or a PAPR and eye protection, even if you're vaccinated, because even though vaccination is good, it's not perfect, and we don't want you getting measles and transmitting it to patients. Um, maintain a mask uh, on the patient, especially if they have to leave the room, and put up appropriate signage, which we have here at Christiana Care and every hospital should be able to provide. Next slide. So this is what came out from DPH on January 11th. And um, if you want to write those phone numbers down or take a picture with your phone, um, those are the numbers to remember in case you do see or think you are seeing a case of measles. So they said any individual who was exposed to measles and was displaying symptoms should uh, contact the Office of Infectious Disease Epidemiology, and those are the numbers, um, to coordinate testing, receive guidance, and limit any further exposures. Next slide. So I'll show you what we do here at Christiana Care. Um, other hospitals in Delaware may do something a little different, but I think these are the basics that you want to remember. Uh, uh, first of all, your most important diagnostic tool is your history and physical exam. If you don't take a travel history and take an immunization history, uh, take a history on how this illness has progressed and do a good physical exam, you're not going to be able to diagnose a case. To confirm measles, you want to obtain specimens of serum, nasopharynx or throat, and urine and perform PCR testing. And I'll show you on the next slide how that looks. And then measles specific IgM on serum. And between all of those methods, you're going to be able to make a diagnosis if the patient does have measles. IgG is really for um, epidemiologic um, purposes more than for diagnosing a case, but it's PCR on those samples and measles IgM. Next slide. So we have, um, Order sets built in for ordering measles serology and measles PCR, as you can see here. Again, if you go to another hospital, it's not Christiana Care. Uh, maybe you have something similar built. If not, and you need to put in singleton orders, well, those are what you need to order. And then I think it's important for clinicians to be guided on how to obtain the specimen. So that's what you see on the right. You have to use the proper swabs and the proper viral transport media, get it to the lab, um, and in the in almost all cases, uh, the hospital lab is going to refer it to the state lab where they perform that PCR testing. Next slide. Unfortunately, there's not a lot that we can do for treatment of measles um, uh, other than to provide supportive care. Vitamin A can be given if you're in a resource poor country, and it probably should be given to any severely ill patient just because we know that low uh, vitamin A levels predispose to more severe disease. The one antiviral drug that is active against measles is ribavirin. Uh, unfortunately, ribavirin is a pain in the neck to use. It's very expensive. It primarily has been used in the United States to treat severely ill patients. Uh, and I should point out that it is not FDA approved. Next slide. So preventive efforts include uh, appropriate isolation, which I just went over with you, care of exposed persons, 
um, to provide them post-exposure prophylaxis, which I'll show you in a moment, uh, and then try to contain it by um, outbreak control. Now, quarantine is not the same as isolation. Isolation is what you do to a patient who has the disease. Quarantine is what you do to a patient or to somebody who's been exposed. And as I mentioned, in Philadelphia, there were exposed people who were instructed to quarantine and did not. Fortunately, they did not develop measles and spread it because that could have been disastrous. And then finally, of course, immunization, which is our mainstay of prevention. Next slide. So uh, in the United States, measles vaccine is almost exclusively available as MMR vaccine, which is, I'm sure you know, uh, protects against measles, mumps, and rubella. The MMR vaccine is approved and recommended for uh, 12 months of age and older. There's also a combination vaccine with MMR and varicella, which is indicated and recommended for 12 months to 12 years. Uh, these are live viral vaccines for both for all three components, measles, mumps, and rubella. So you have to remember that. They contain gelatin, neomycin, and egg, to which some people can react. Next slide. Um, Measles and uh, MMR vaccine is very safe, but very safe does not, does not mean risk-free. Uh, so you can get side effects. Fever, uh, low grade usually, can occur six to 12 days after the MMR vaccine. A transient rash can develop in about 5% of people. And back when I used to do general pediatrics, I would always warn people about this so they don't freak out. This is a live viral vaccine. And what you're seeing there is kind of like a very mild transient case of measles, but they are not contagious. Febrile seizures uh, can occur more with MMRV than with MMR, uh, and thrombocytopenia, which is usually transient and usually not severe, can happen in uh, somewhere between 1 in 22,000 and 1 in 40,000 individuals. Next slide. Very effective vaccine. We know that for measles, one dose of MMR provides about 93% protection. And as I mentioned earlier, it's not waning immunity uh, accounting for those other 7%. It's, it's a primary vaccine failure, which is why in 1989 and 1990, we implemented a second dose of MMR. So the first one's usually given at one year of age, and the second one is usually given at four to five years of age. And at that point, uh, you're about 97% protected from measles. And then I'm not going to go over it, but you can see the, the effectiveness for mumps and rubella as well. If you have natural measles, which I did, and maybe some of the others on the call did, uh, that is felt to pro provide lifelong immunity. Next slide. So here are the precautions and contraindications for MMR vaccine. First, the contraindications. Uh, pregnancy is the chief one, and that's mostly for the rubella component as opposed to measles or mumps component, but you shouldn't give it to pregnant women. Um, um, previous people who've had uh, people who've had previous severe allergic reactions, and I mentioned neomycin and egg because some people can react to that. People who are severely immunocompromised, and I'll just give you an example for uh, HIV-infected people, it would be a CD4 count less than 200, or people who've had live other live vaccines within the preceding four weeks. On the left are the precautions. That, that's not the same as a contraindication. Precaution means you should think about it before you do it and perhaps delay it. So people who come in with a mild acute febrile illness, they can have their vaccine deferred until they're over that illness. People who have thrombocytopenia probably shouldn't get it just because measles can on occasion cause thrombocytopenia. Um, kids who've had recent VIG or other blood products probably need to have it delayed. And the one example I'll give you is kids who've gotten IVIG for Kawasaki, which is the most common reason a child will get IVIG, you have to delay MMR vaccine for 11 months. People who have uh, active tuberculosis should not receive the MMR vaccine because it can actually um, kind of cause a temporary immune paralysis so, such that uh, tuberculosis can progress. Uh, and you, if you're a clinician that gives um, um, MMR vaccine, you probably know that um, it can actually interfere with tuberculin skin test results as well for the same reason. People who are immunocompromised, um, people who've had a personal or family history of seizures, they should be considered a precaution. If you have a family history of immunodeficiency, that's a precaution. And then, as mentioned, uh, people who've had severe reaction to uh, uh, potential vaccine components. Next slide. 
So one reason that we're in a bit of a pickle in the United States is because we don't have ideal uh, vaccination rates. And for children, that often is because of vaccine skeptical parents. Uh, and if you're in practice, you know that this happens. You see it all the time. Some vaccine skeptical parents refuse all immunizations. Some refuse some immunizations. Some want to pursue the so-called alternative immunization schedule. But as a result of this vaccine skepticism or hesitancy or refusal, almost 1% of all U.S. toddlers have had no immunizations. And we know that outbreaks of things like measles and pertussis are often either initiated or sustained by unimmunized children. And uh, to add to vaccine skepticism on the part of parents, various states in the United States uh, um, provide for um, school requirement exemptions um, due to religious or personal belief exemptions in addition to medical exemptions. Big problem. So I'll read this to you. Um, um, it's a cartoon. Obviously, I had no idea measles was so dangerous. It's almost like making life or death decisions about my child's health care based on a Facebook video is a bad idea. Uh, that's a cartoon. The next one is a true quote uh, from the Natural Health Anti-Vaxxers Community website. Uh, my my three-year-old is not vaccinated and there is currently a measles outbreak in my state. Any suggestions for precautions I can take to protect her would be very much appreciated. appreciated. And you can't make that up. I mean, people go to great lengths not to vaccinate their kids, which is a big, big problem. Next slide. Don't get me started on vaccine refusal because it is one of my major pet peeves in my professional and personal lives. Um, vaccines are good for kids. They cause adults. Next slide. Well, what do you do if you're in a travel situation? So you're planning uh, travel abroad to an area which might have measles. And what do you do in outbreak situations as far as giving MMR vaccines? Well, first of all, it's important to recognize that kids six months to 11 months of age are at high risk for the reasons I gave you, waning maternal immunity. Uh, and they should, they should get a dose of MMR. So if you're flying with your infant to England, you definitely want to give them an MMR vaccine. Now, that doesn't count for their vaccine series, so they still have to get two doses after they turn 12 months of age. For kids 12 months of age and older, they need two doses of MMR separated by at least 28 days. And as I mentioned, it's usually given at one uh, year of age and then four to five. But if you're planning travel or in an outbreak situation, you can condense that time interval down to 28 days. And then if it's a teenager or adult without evidence of immunity, you give two doses of MMR separated by 28 days. Next slide. Back in 2019, when we were experiencing a lot of measles uh, in this country, the CDC issued a dear provider le letter. And just to kind of clarify some points for clinicians, First of all, um, you don't need to actively screen adults for measles immunity because most of them are going to be immune and uh, at low risk of disease in a non-outbreak setting. Um, and the second bullet point is that if you have uh, somebody entertaining international travel, make sure to have them up to date with their measles vaccine. And as um, I showed you on that uh, previous slide, you can go on that CDC web light, website and, and click on that link, and it will ask you things like your age, uh, whether you've ever had measles, whether you've had measles vaccine, uh, whether you're immunocompromised, and they will tell you exactly what you need. Uh, because I think what we're facing here now, as we're sitting here in 2014, is a high risk for non-immune people from the U.S. to acquire it uh, when they're abroad and bring it home and then unfortunately unleash it on their community, just like we saw here in the Delaware Valley. Um, and if you've got somebody who's traveling internationally and they have an unknown immune status, um, just vaccinate them unless there are contraindications. Don't wait for blood tests, just give them the MMR vaccine. Next slide. So to be considered immune, you have to have one of the one or more of these um, bullet points, um, two documented doses of MMR, um, and it doesn't even matter if you somebody obtains a titer. If you've had two MMRs, uh, you're considered immune. If you've ever had a positive measles IgG titer, uh, you are considered immune. If you have had physician-diagnosed measles, um, now that's 
that's in the recommendations. My my concern is I I'm, I'm worried, especially among younger, more recently trained physicians, they may never have seen measles and may not be able to accurately diagnose it. And I've certainly seen many many cases of um, other viral rashes that were thought by a physician to be measles. So uh, I would I would be careful about that one. Patients born before 1957 are almost always going to be immune as a result of natural infection, and patients um, who have received one dose of MMR can be considered immune. Again, with 93%, um, you know, a, a, a rate of um, uh, confidence. Now, you notice there that underlined is healthcare workers, they cannot be considered immune if they were born before 1957. They have to have one of those other bullet points to document immunity. Uh, and um, healthcare workers cannot be considered immune if they've only had one dose of MMR, they need two. Next slide. So all of us healthcare personnel uh, should have evidence of immunity. Uh, if we uh, as healthcare per personnel are exposed and non-immune, we can receive post-exposure prophylaxis, but we also have to be furloughed from work because we cannot show ourselves in a healthcare facility while we are in potentially infectious. Advance that. Make sure you keep your vaccination records. You'd be surprised at how many adults, including healthcare providers, uh, don't know their status. Next slide. So if you have been exposed, um, MMR vaccine is your most important tool. And if you give MMR within 72 hours of exposure, you can provide 83% protection against that person getting measles. Um, next slide. Immune serum globulin or IgIM, which is the uh, intramuscular form of immune globulin can be given within six days in the post-exposure setting. And then IVIG can be given to pregnant women and severely immunocompromised people who are not immune um, and then advance that. The problem is there's no immune serum globulin to be had. It's just very difficult to get. The last time we had to use it in the state of Delaware was a few years ago in a hepatitis A exposure setting, and it took a week to get it. And that's just not clinically useful if you have to wait that long. So MMR is your primary defense and IVIG uh, if, you, uh, if you, the person's not eligible for MMR vaccine. Next slide. And this is the last slide. And again, this is this is what I and public health authorities across the country are worried about, which is that um, it's out there. It's in the gl global community, and we have travelers there. If they acquire it while traveling abroad, they can bring it back to the United States and, and have it spread, just as we had kind of a little microcosm of that in December and January uh, right here in our area. So get vaccinated is the main take home message for that. Now, that is the end of my presentation, but uh, we have plenty of time for questions if there are any. And I appreciate your attention. Fabulous, Doug. Fabulous job, Dr. Epps. Excellent presentation. Uh, let's now address those questions in the chat box. Lynn, if you'll help me with that. Sure thing. Um, we have... Um... A question, do you think the re the refugee movements across Europe and decreased vaccination rates during the COVID pandemic play in the increase of measles cases and could travel in and out of the U.S. Uh, affect the situation here as well? 100%. And it's been documented that refugees are at high risk. And that's not only in Ukraine, but in uh, Sudan and other areas of Africa as well. Um, yeah, and and at one point, pre -pan, pre COVID pandemic, Ukraine was one of the hardest hit countries for measles, um, and, and due in part to health infrastructure. But it's there, and it will only get worse. Now they've got their hands full in Ukraine, so they're probably not paying close attention to measles. Um, but it, uh, it yeah, the, whoever asked that question hit the nail right on the head. Excellent. Thank you. How does the concept of uh, equity zones play into the strategy for catching up on missed vaccinations? And what should physicians address with parents who are worried about vaccinating their children? 
I'm not familiar with the term equity zones, but I can only imagine that it has to do with um, the fact that certain populations are unimmunized or underimmunized as a result of socioeconomic status or other factors relating to um, uh, their living situation. So what does one do to address that? Well, thank heavens here in the United States, we have the um, a, a, pro a program called VFC, Vaccines for Children. Uh, I think one day there will be a program for called VFA, Vaccines for Adults as well. So that under immunized or unimmunized uh, people uh, have really have, there, there shouldn't be an excuse not to get them up to date. Uh, they're eligible to receive uh, VFC vaccine, you know, clinicians, no clinicians in practice know better than I how to do that. Um, but yeah, we definitely should do that. I worry more about other countries, quite honestly. And I think the equity issue is probably a bigger problem if you um, think about it globally. Thank you. Is measles on the extended viral respiratory panel? Could it be added or do we need to send a separate swab for testing for it? So the answer is no, it's not on the um, PCR-based panel that uh, we use here at Christiana and that a lot of other hospitals use. So you would have to specifically ask for it using um, the, the, the kinds of equipment that I showed you, the special swabs, transport media, order the PCR, and then again, it's usually going to be transported to the state lab, which offers a pretty good turnaround time. Usually they'll get it done same day or next day because they know how important it is. Steve. Thank you. That, there's Steve. Are questions in our chat box. Do we have any additional questions for Dr. Epps? Like Dr. Steve. Steve, uh, it, was, it was an excellent talk. Sorry, there was not more people attending. I have, um, I guess, two questions. Where you said since. Uh, People that are allergic to neomycin or array, what's the alternative is there for the va vaccines for them? Well, there's no alternative vaccine, but what would be recommended if somebody has a really severe reaction history is to have that MMR vaccine given in a location like an allergist's office or an emergency room where um, any allergic reactions could be attended to. Okay. And, you know, I guess I'm surprised that we haven't had particularly a more severe problem with the measles in the country since um, we, there are, we have a lot of people that aren't vaccinated, never mind the anti-vax people, because I know like the Casita Jews were a problem, I guess in the 2019, where um, they don't get vaccinated till late, sort of like the Amish. And that was a big problem in Muncie and in uh, Brooklyn, where the mayor of New York at that point essentially quarantined and isolated Brooklyn because they came back from Israel and they weren't vaccinated and spread the measles through the city of New York like wildfire. And with these people not being vaccinated, that we haven't had a more serious problem this time. Well, you know, I, from, I share your concern completely. I, I you know, again, from I, other countries. Yeah, I mean, if if kindergartners in this country are down to ninety three percent for their MM for having had two MMR vaccines, that's not good enough. And I think it's a powder keg, Stuart. I completely agree with you, especially with the numbers you gave for Europe at yep. this point. Yep. Because, yeah. okay. No, I just, Dr. Kushner, I'll turn it back over to you. Sure, Steve, maybe one other question. Do you have any good advice on getting those parents who don't want to vaccinate their children 
how, how do you convince these good folks? I know there are some physicians that refuse to allow them to even enter practice, um, but I have a few in my practice and kind of I encourage them to consider it again and again, but it just seems to be a bit of a frustration for me. Any good advice? Well, so it's not easy, that's for sure. Uh, and, and you know, about 1% of families are really steadfast in their refusal. And I think they're very, very difficult to convince. Uh, but you've got a lot of people who are vaccine skeptical who you can convince. And the it's been shown over and over again, and it's published that the, the very most important thing is a strong provider recommendation. So if you say something like, uh, well, we've got this vaccine if you want it, that's not going to do the job for most people. It's, uh, look, you've, you, you know, uh, I, I have HPV vaccine for your kid. Um, you need to give it to her because this will stop her from having cancer. Uh, and, you know, in very concise, uh, somewhat authoritative uh, terms, don't be, don't talk down to people, of course. People don't like to be talked down to, but a strong provider recommendation. And, you know, the, just to go on a step further, and you kind of mentioned it already, but there are practices, very good practices, that fire people, fire patients who won't get vaccinated. And, you know, the American Academy of Pediatrics for years um, said that they did not um, endorse that approach. They now say they do because they they know so many good pediatric practices and family practices um, have, done, have taken that exact approach. And so... Um, I, I have, you know, I think if you do fire patients, you're on good ground because the American Academy of Pediatrics says you can. Uh, I do worry about what will happen to those people if you fire them, because they will almost inevitably uh, seek a, a healthcare provider that's inferior to you. Thank you, Stephen. Appreciate it. I just remember what my mother did with us. Since I was the oldest, I got the measles from first since there was no MMR. And my mother just, and I had the mumps and I had German measles. And she, she just put a, everybody in the room. She figured if I got it, let them all get it at the same time. And she was over with it all, you know, <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> Yeah, and that that was common practice in the old days. Yeah, and in the, in the old days, that was it. She figured it was like all over within three weeks. They all had it. <laughs> yeah, um, I put my trust in vaccines these days. Yeah, well, they didn't have it just 